Hi everyone, in this video we are going to introduce the concept of impedance which is very useful in electronics. But before that, we need to talk about complex numbers. And don't worry, there is nothing complicated about complex numbers, they only exist in order to make our lives simple. All the theory of complex numbers naturally arises from the simple definition of the imaginary number i. We define it as the number whose square is equal to negative 1. In other words, i is the square root of negative 1. Now, in electronics, the letter i is reserved for the current, so we prefer to use the letter j to represent this imaginary number. The first thing we can do with this is to derive our first result, which is that the inverse of j is equal to negative j. And here, I go very slowly with this derivation in order to warm up. Starting from 1 over j, we can multiply both the numerator and the denominator by negative j. So we obtain negative j over negative j square, but by definition j square is equal to negative 1. So we can simplify and we end up with negative j. Alright, so now we are going to move faster. For any two real numbers, x and y, we can define the complex number z as being equal to x plus j times y. We say that x is the real part of z and y is the imaginary part of z. Be careful here. The real part x is a real number, but the imaginary part y is also a real number. People are sometimes confused by this. When a complex number is written as a real part plus j times an imaginary part, we say that it is written in the algebraic form. Since a complex number is represented by two numbers x and y, it is natural to represent it graphically in a two-dimensional plane, which we call the complex plane. The real part goes on the horizontal axis and the imaginary part on the vertical axis so x and y are just the Cartesian coordinates of the point z. But you probably know that instead of determining a point with Cartesian coordinates, we can as well determine it by specifying the distance of the point to the origin and the angle that the point makes with the horizontal axis. That's what we call the polar coordinates of the point. In the case of complex numbers, the distance to the origin is called the modulus, and the angle is called the phase. Now, it is easy to see that the modulus r is the hypotenuse of a right triangle with a base x and a height y, so the Pythagorean theorem tells us that r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. From basic trigonometry, the tangent of the phase phi is equal to the opposite length over the adjacent length. As a result, phi is the arctangent of y over x. Pay attention here that the tangent is a function with a period of pi that is defined from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. So if x is negative, then we must add pi to the result. We can also invert this equation and write that x is the modulus times the cosine of the phase, while y is the modulus times the sine of the phase. If we substitute these into the algebraic form of z, we obtain the trigonometric form of z, that is, z equals r in factor of cosine phi plus j sine phi. We can also express z in a third form that is extremely useful, as we shall see. For this, let us consider the function f of phi defined as e to the negative phi times cosine phi plus j sine phi. I let you calculate the derivative, which is easily obtained by using the product rule, and you should find that the derivative is zero for any value of phi. This means that this function is constant. We know that this constant is equal to one because it is the value that we obtain if we choose phi equals zero. Because this function is equal to one, we conclude that exponential j phi is equal to cosine phi plus j sine phi. This result gives us the exponential form of z. 
z is equal to r times e to the j phi. Now consider two complex numbers z1 and z2. If we need to add or subtract the two numbers, the algebraic form is a good choice because the real part of the sum is equal to the sum of the real parts. Same for the imaginary part. If the two numbers need to be multiplied, it is also easy with the algebraic form, but it is even simpler with the exponential form. We simply multiply the moduli and we add the phases. If we want to calculate the quotient z1 over z2, we take the quotient of the moduli and the difference of the phases. The exponential form also makes it easy to calculate the square root of a complex number. We take the square root of the modulus and divide the phase by 2. And finally, the trigonometric form makes it easy to make the connection between Cartesian coordinates and the polar coordinates. The last definition we need to unleash the power of complex numbers is that of the complex conjugate. If z equals x plus jy, then the complex conjugate is defined to be x minus jy and is denoted z star. The complex conjugate is useful, for example, when we want to find the modulus of a complex number written in the algebraic form. It is equal to the square root of z z star. And finally, multiplying a complex number by a complex number of modulus 1 results in a rotation of the complex number. This is easily seen by using the exponential form. This is all we need to know about complex numbers. There is nothing complicated, so make sure you master this subject as it will be very useful and not only in electronics. We are now ready to introduce the concept of impedance. Impedance is a generalization of the concept of resistance to capacitors and inductors when working with AC currents. It allows us to apply Ohm's law to these components that result in algebraic equations, which are much easier to deal with than differential equations. To introduce the concept, let us start by considering a capacitor C to which we apply an AC voltage V with an amplitude A and an angular frequency omega. So, V equals A cosine omega T. By definition of the capacitance, the charge Q equals C times V. Since current is a charge per unit time, it is given by the time derivative of the charge, I equals dQ over dt, which transforms the cosine into a negative sign. And we can transform the sine back to a cosine by adding a phase of pi over 2. So this means that the current in a capacitor leads the voltage. So we see from these two equations that the current flowing through the capacitor is not proportional to the applied voltage because there is a phase shift. This means that there exists no constant number R that relates the voltage and current by Ohm's law. In other words, Ohm's law doesn't apply to a capacitor. In order to solve this problem, the idea is to introduce a complex voltage. So imagine that we are able to apply the voltage given by A times E to the J omega T, and we denote it by adding a tilde to the letter V. Let us then try to determine what the resulting complex current is. For this, we follow the same path that we did when we determined what the real current was. We start by writing that the complex charge Q tilt is given by C times the complex voltage V tilt. And then we take the time derivative and we obtain the complex current I tilt. So I tilt is equal to JC omega A E to the J omega T. And now we see that the complex current is proportional to the complex voltage. We can define the constant number Z tilt sub C equals 1 over jc omega such that Ohm's law applies to the capacitor. This number is called the complex impedance of the capacitor. So by using complex numbers, we can directly solve the problem without having to perform any differentiation 
and without even having to mind about the capacitor's charge. We simply divide the complex voltage by the capacitor's impedance in order to get the complex current. It is just as easy as with a resistor. Now, of course, complex voltages and complex currents do not exist, but we can obtain the real voltage and the real current simply by taking the real part of the corresponding complex quantities. This is easy. Remember, exponential j omega t is equal to cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. So we recover the real voltage a cosine omega t, and we can check that we also recover the correct expression for the real current. Of course, we don't really see the benefit of using complex numbers for this simple circuit, but the benefit will become obvious when we will analyze circuits that combine resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Let us see what happens when we apply the same AC voltage to an inductor. We know that the voltage is equal to the inductance L times the time derivative of the current. So this time we have to integrate and we find that the current is equal to A over L omega cosine omega t minus pi over 2. Once again, the current through the inductor is not proportional to the applied voltage. So the inductor does not obey to Ohm's law. But if we apply a complex voltage, then the resulting complex current is proportional to it. It follows that we can define the complex impedance of the inductor as Z tilde sub L equals JL omega. Thus, we can directly obtain the complex current by dividing the complex voltage by the inductor's impedance without having to calculate an integral. As before, the real current is obtained by taking the real part of the complex current, and we can check that the result is correct. By proceeding in exactly the same way, we can check that the impedance of a resistor R is real and just equal to the resistance. We showed that the impedance of an inductor L is equal to JL omega, and the impedance of a capacitor is equal to 1 over JC omega. In general, the impedance of a circuit is a complex number whose real part is called the resistance and the imaginary part is called the reactance. Since it has the same dimension as a resistance, the impedance is measured in ohms. The inverse of the impedance is called the admittance and as for the conductance, it is measured in Siemens. One of the benefits of complex impedances is that, since they obey to Ohm's law, the rules for series and parallel impedances are naturally the same as for resistances. For series impedances, the equivalent impedance is obtained by adding the individual impedances. For parallel impedances, the equivalent admittance is obtained by adding the individual admittances. Remember, the impedance of an inductor has a zero real port and a positive imaginary port. The impedance of a capacitor has a zero real port and a negative imaginary port, and the impedance of a resistor has a positive real port and a zero imaginary port. By the way, we will see in the upcoming chapter on op-amps that we can design a circuit that actually has a negative resistance. But for a standard resistor, it is always positive. So, we can easily represent the impedance of an RLC circuit in the complex plane by adding three vectors, a vector to the right for the resistor, an upward vector for the inductor, and a downward vector for the capacitor. We can see that the inductor's vector decreases when omega decreases, while the capacitor's vector increases. So, there exists a particular value of omega for which the two vertical vectors cancel out, and the resulting impedance is minimum and equal to the resistance. That's when we have a resonance. Okay, we can now conclude this chapter and appreciate the power of the concept of impedance by analyzing an example, which would be much more complicated to analyze by solving differential equations. So, in this circuit, we apply an input voltage Vn equals A cosine omega t, and we want to determine the expression of the output voltage V out.
Not super complicated, but it would be a little bit tedious without the concept of impedance. So here we start by noticing that L and C form a parallel impedance, so we can add the inverses of each impedances and by inverting the result, we obtain the equivalent impedance Z tilt equals JL omega divided by 1 minus LC omega square. So we turn to complex voltages and the circuit can be simplified as follows. And it takes the form of a voltage divider. So we can directly write that V at tilt equals Z tilt over R plus Z tilt times V in tilt. Now all we have to do is to substitute the expression that we obtained for Z tilt. We can simplify and then express the result in exponential form by using the method that we saw earlier. And then we take the real part. The result looks complicated, but it was easy to obtain. Now try to solve the same problem without using complex impedances, just for fun. See you in the next chapter.